Let us pray. Friends, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in God's sight this day and forevermore. Amen. The season of Epiphany, this present season, as I have come to understand it, is a, a season that the church traditionally defines not by one, not even by two, but by three luminous gospel episodes. Episodes in which the, the light shines brightly on Jesus, revealing Him, manifesting Him to the whole world. First episode, the arrival of the Magi, led there by the brightness of a star, a story found exclusively in Matthew. Second episode, the far better attested baptism of Jesus, the, the episode Diane spoke of last Sunday, complete with descending dove and commanding heavenly voice, proclaiming Jesus not merely as beloved, but as the beloved. And finally, this morning's episode from John's Gospel, in which once again the, the divine splendor surrounding Christ shines forth. And I, I must confess, possibly because it was the scripture Sherry and I chose way back in 1986 for our wedding ceremony. I must confess a certain fondness, a certain privileging of this wonderful story whenever I, whenever I personally ponder the meaning of epiphany. Not that the wedding at Cana is a simple episode around which to gather one's thoughts. On the contrary, this is one of those biblical stories, and, and John's Gospel houses a number of such stories. One of those biblical stories in which each little detail, the number of the stone jars, for example, the, the size of each of the stone jars, um, the reaction of the steward when he tastes the wine that's handed him that Jesus offers. And also, also above all, I think, the, the role Mary, the mother of the Lord, plays here. It's an important role, an intriguing role. Each of those little details has significance, some of them deep significance. And it makes it impossible to address every single facet of the story in one lonely Sunday sermon. Which I guess leaves me no choice but to cut to the chase and to ponder this beautiful story in light of what I regard as its crucial aspects. Think of them as the three W's. The wedding, the water, the wine. Let's start, let's start with the wedding. No doubt, no doubt it's the fact that this, the first of Jesus' signs in John's Gospel, is performed at a wedding that leads many couples to incorporate this story into their wedding liturgies. And that's what Sherry and I did back in 1986. It's a, it's a good choice if I don't say so myself, and, and the, fact, the fact is, the first of the signs offered in John's Gospel, the fact that it takes place at a wedding, is something that I have long regarded as just simply wonderful. Because marriage captures a central dimension of what it is for us to be human, including not only those exalted wonderful sounding vows we exchange at a wedding, including not only the, the agape love, the self-giving love without which no marriage will survive, but also that marriage incorporates the, well, the earthy dimension of human life. 
including the earthiness of human sexuality. And I'm reminded here of a beautiful prayer I, I, I stumbled across a couple of weeks back when we were celebrating the second Sunday in the season of Christmas. And, and remember, Christmas is only 12 days long. Many years we don't get a second Sunday during the Christmas season. But this year we had one. And so I came across a prayer I've never, I've never really taken note of before. Here's how it goes. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our glory. That's not a, that's not a misspeak. Our glory is to stand before the world as your sons and daughters. May the simple beauty of Jesus' birth summon us always to love what is most deeply human and to see your word made flesh reflected in the lives of those whose lives we touch. We ask this through Christ our Lord. I, 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 I love that prayer. And I especially love its central petition that, that we're asking God to equip us, to equip us through the simple beauty of Jesus' birth, to cultivate the capacity to love what is most deeply human and to see your word made flesh. In other words, to see Jesus Christ reflected in those whose lives we touch. See, my, my, my fear, my fear is that far too often we as Christians, we as church, present the gospel in ways that hurry past the incarnational truth we celebrate at Christmas. Hurry past the, the nitty-gritty of what Joseph and Mary would have experienced when their child was born amidst barnyard noise. And yes, barnyard smells. And yet when we speak of the epiphany, of the manifestation of Christ's glory. It is precisely the glory of one, precisely the glory of the one, for whom things human are precious, the one who yearns for his disciples, meaning you and me, to regard things human as precious and worthy and reflective of God's unbound goodness. By launching his first sign at a wedding, Christ beautifully demonstrates his solidarity with humanity. His solidarity with people not unlike us. Well, that this first sign also involves the use of water is, I think, also a critical piece of the the beautiful mystery that unfolds at Cana. We're told, of course, that this is not just any water, but water that had been put aside for the Jewish rites of purification. And, and, and our response to that may vary depending on our own background. But for me, what that triggers is a reminder that this episode, at the very start of the second chapter of John's Gospel follows on the heels of a first chapter in which John the Baptist plays a signal role, uh, including baptizing Jesus. A baptism which, like all baptisms, presumably made use of copious amounts of water. My point is this. Jesus, when he begins the process of rescuing the couple, whose wedding festivities appear to be going off the rails, as soon as he begins, he begins by reaching for something that is already inherently good. And here, yes, let me concede that water is ambiguous in Scripture. After all, the image we have at the very beginning of the Bible the first chapter of Genesis, the opening verses of Genesis, makes it clear that the, there are waters of chaos. And occasionally we, we hear stories, think of Noah, above all, the story of Noah, in which water plays a, a threatening role. 
And here in British Columbia, where we've experienced a, a couple of atmospheric rivers, we know all about the destruction that water untamed, unchecked can do. And yet we also know the blessing of water within the tamed, created realm in which we live. And we know what life would be like without water, and we realize that there would be no life without water. And so acknowledging all of that, acknowledging that water in our own lives and in the world of the Bible um, is a reminder of chaos, nevertheless, within the contours of God's good creation, water is already a good thing which Jesus, starting with water, turns into something even better, turns into wine. And if we take that steward's word for it, he produced wine of a particularly rare vintage. I'm reminded, reminded uh, when we talk of that transforming of water into wine, of a disagreement I managed to get into in my final year of seminary with my liturgy prof. He was arguing that baptism was the church's defining sacrament, to which I responded by insisting that what we do at this table right behind me, the Eucharist, Holy Communion, is the defining sacrament. And I still believe that uh, 35 years later, which doesn't prove I'm correct, simply that I'm very pig-headed. Nevertheless, when I show up for a day at Disney World, one of the theme parks, surely the defining moment isn't when I buy my ticket. I'm hoping that the defining moment is when I spend time with my family enjoying the sights and the sounds and, and the people watching and for the braver members of my family, some of the rides as well. Um, the ticket is what allows me to get into the main festivities of the day. And I believe that baptism is our entry to the ongoing festivity that is symbolized at this table. That takes place at this table as a reminder here in the conditions of our earthly lives of what God has in store for us ultimately. It's not for nothing you see that in this Gospel, this Gospel of John in which Christ transforms the goodness of water into the even greater goodness of wine, that this is the very Gospel precisely at the moment when he's thinking of departing from them, that he tells them that he wants his joy to, to be in them so that their joy may be full, so that their joy may be complete. Nor is it mere coincidence that in this same gospel, still as Christ prepares to leave them, that he again assures them, yes, you do have pain now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Let's be clear. When Christ manifests His glory, it is truly glory that He thereby manifests. Light and life and love. How fitting for the first sign of that glory to have been unveiled at a wedding celebration. A hint of the wedding celebration, Scripture calls it the, the marriage feast of the Lamb, to which you and I have been called as honored guests, honored guests, cherished guests. And yes, in our moments of honest self-reflection, we all wonder whether we are even worthy to be invited to so exalted a feast. Found myself these past few days as I pondered this beautiful, beautiful story. Found myself thinking about, uh, about a song Johnny Cash wrote many, many, many years ago. And I, I need to be honest here, I'm not somebody who... Uh, considers himself or anybody else would consider an expert where it comes to country music. I'm more of a jazz, classical, and classic rock sort of guy. But I have an affection for, for Johnny Cash, and I have a well, 
played and often played disc of the concert he gave at San Quentin Prison with June Carter and their band. And, and a few months before that concert, he had toured with June the Holy Land. And he spent time at Cana and was inspired to write a song with, with the title, He Turned the Water into Wine. He Turned the Water into Wine. It's not a fancy song. It's a lovely song. Um, but it came. It came from a moment of genuine inspiration. And, and as I experience that song when it's sung at San Quentin, what I hear, and I don't think this is all in my imagination, I don't think I'm making this up, what I'm hearing is that Johnny Cash knows that he's singing about his own life, He's think, singing about the lives of those very tough men gathered in that hall to hear him. And surely he's singing about our lives as well. Because surely the real miracle of Cana, the real miracle to which it points, is as profound as it is to turn water into wine. It's even more, even more profound to take the broken pieces of our lives the jagged-edged fragments of our lives, and to transform them into something beautiful, something, something worthy of God, something worthy of those who have received an invitation to that splendid marriage feast, that place where we will know for sure that we have been made new, that God has put behind us our sins and our brokenness, and that we are being welcomed into the presence of the Almighty. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the one who can touch and change and transform us all. May it be so. Amen.